What's up guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House. My guest today is Felix Zuloff. Felix is the owner of Zuloff Asset Management, a Switzerland-based hedge fund. He's also the president and CEO of Zuloff Consulting. Now, Felix, Felix is uh, somebody who's been in the game for the finance game for about 50 years. So when you have survived five decades in the markets as a professional investor, you have a level of experience and most importantly, perspective that you cannot fake. And that's why I wanted to talk to Felix today because it's harder than ever to uh, navigate the sensational headlines that try their hardest to convince us every single day that something major is happening because something major is not happening every single day. You know, if you're, if you're an investor with a time horizon similar to me, I'm not a trader, I'm an investor. My average hold time in a company is between six months to five to seven years. Call that medium term, long term, whatever suits you, that's my time horizon. I need to work really, really hard to make sure I'm protecting my mind from these sensational headlines that try to convince me the game has changed every single day because the game has not changed every single day. Some days the game does change, but not every day. Now I get it, right? Media is in the business of generating clicks and capturing your attention. I'm a capitalist. I support these incentive systems, but they don't have your best interest in mind. I actually did a fun exercise a couple weeks ago where I pulled up the front page of like CNN, Fox News, Wall Street Journal, and a handful of local papers around where I live, just to look at the day over day pendulum between opinions on the same issues or the forecasts for various issues. And it's remarkably inconsistent as you could imagine, right? They have to keep us surprised so that we click on something. So what they told us yesterday will not do today. It's gotta be a new thing, right? Not our best interest, but I get it. I don't fault anybody for it. Now, we didn't just talk about markets with Felix today. We also talked about two trends that I'm paying a lot of attention to. One being the rise of populism and the second being the rise of safetyism, right? Populism, which really began to emerge, as I saw it, in around 2010 and then really accelerated in 2016. Whereas the rise of safetyism kind of began to emerge in American universities around 2013 and then obviously really took off with the arrival of COVID. Now, uh, it goes without saying, so safetyism being, you know, the, the mindset that says, uh, we need a third party to keep me safe from risk, right? You prefer more intervention, more protocol, more regulation uh, to keep you safe from risk. Now, I totally get it. Now, what's interesting about this, from my perspective, is the whole world is engaged right now in risk management, right? We're all trying to manage the same risk, that being the pandemic. But if you look around the globe, Many countries, continents, and states are taking a very different approach to it. Now, why is this interesting to me? Because nobody knows what the best path forward is. I guarantee you, because nobody's dealt with this before, right? We're all just doing our best with our variety of risk tolerances, letting that influence our opinions and decisions on how to move forward. And it's very, very tough and no one knows. That's why, you know, the world is awash in anxiety and uh, people are a little bit stressed out right now. So first of all, I encourage everybody to act first with compassion, right? As you move through your community, I, I try to make a practice of this. When I succeed, I'm definitely happier with the person I am and the decisions I make, but I try to lead with compassion because everyone's going through it right now. But back to my conversation with Felix, where we landed was the same as we know, safe haven asset classes, things like gold, Bitcoin, maybe real estate that, that take you out of the capital markets and the equities markets, those safe haven asset classes that perform differently in the event of a market crash. Will there be the emergence of safe haven locations for people who are looking for a certain way of life? Now, right now, for example, you can say this already exists. Life in Australia today is very different from life in Florida, right? For better or for worse. Once again, I don't think anybody knows the best path forward. I certainly don't. We're all just doing our best and trying what we think might work in a situation we've never dealt with before. Having said that, if you live in Australia versus Florida, you may feel really, really strongly about how well your government is doing at managing this risk with their approach, or you may think this is ridiculous, I'm out of here, right? So if this is ridiculous and you're out of here, where do you go? And that's when we get into safe haven locations, right? Game theory that may dictate how people move around the globe in the years to come to find a culture that more complements what they're looking for. Now, the short answer to this, will this exist? I say, yes, absolutely, it already exists today. The long answer is obviously a bit more complex, 
how will people migrate around the globe with the variety of challenges with passports and international travel. But I think we're going that direction. I'm somebody who believes that 2020 was not the event. It was the trigger point for the events to come. And our life in 10 years will look remarkably different from how it does today. And we don't know how that's going to look, but I would suspect that it's going to look remarkably different uh, in various locations around the globe, right? For the last, for most of my life, right, as we travel through at least Western countries, life is pretty similar, right? The way we go about life, the way we're policed, our sense of freedom and safety and predictability and all this stuff has been relatively consistent. I think that may change a little bit. And states, countries, and continents may develop more of an identity about how they manage. Now, I'm somebody who has, uh, in my family, we have Canadian passports and American passports. And right now we're based in Canada. I love it, I'm on the West Coast, it's beautiful. But my wife and I do discuss if and when we would option that US passport and go south to find a different environment. Because what I love about the United States is how sovereign the states are, right? Uh, up in Canada, it's relatively federal. Life looks pretty similar from one coast to the other. Whereas in the United States, what I love about it is you can go to a variety of different states and get a completely different experience. In the last six months, I've been to Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, I'm probably forgetting some. But suffice to say, right now, when risk management is at an all time high, each one of these states could almost feel, it does feel like a completely different country. And that's interesting to me because how does that trend accelerate, right? I tend to look at things not as static events because nothing in the natural world is a static event. Everything is always in motion and growing or changing, right? So if you look at the polarization of the various cultures and the way risk management is being approached all over the world or even just within your country, I always like to ask the question, what happens next? What will this turn into if this trend continues, right? What if it accelerates? What then, right? So lots of fun stuff that I talked about with Felix today. Um, I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. I love geeking out on this stuff. Super, super fun. So three things before we jump into this interview. Number one, I'm hosting an event in Vancouver, Canada on January 16th and 17th. This is like the financial Super Bowl sp specifically focused on the commodities market. It's called the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference and right beneath this video, there's a pinned comment where you can go to the event page, check it out. I'm gonna be joined by an amazing roster of keynote speakers live on stage, like former Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, former President of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, best-selling finance author of all time, Rich Dad, Robert Rich Dad Kiyosaki, uh, Federal Reserve Insider, Danielle DiMartino Booth, and, and dozens and dozens more. I've got about 100 keynote speakers we're flying in so that I can square off with them on stage. I got questions, I want answers. So this is the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, January 16th and 17th. Come out, it's gonna be tons and tons of fun. Number two, the cash from this YouTube channel is now donated to an organization called Zero Ceiling. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by giving the at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness environments and then surround them with positive influences and career training. I love what they do. Check them out if you're interested. And number three, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. Here's Felix Zuloff, enjoy. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, what's up guys? Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House and I'm here with v Felix Zuloff. Felix, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much and thank you for having me on your show. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it's about time I got you on. I'm, I'm really excited about this. I've got a handful of directions. I want to take this conversation and uh, we're going to make the most of our time. So for anybody who's not familiar with yourself uh, or uh, Zuloff Consulting, could you start there, Felix? Who are you and how do you spend your time? What do you do during the day? Well, I, I used to manage money all my life uh, from um, age uh, 18 years uh, onwards. Um, I sold my money management business uh, a good 10 years ago and uh, manage only uh, proprietary money. Uh, so Zulauf Asset Management is my, uh, is my family office. And somebody uh, uh, asked me to write uh, and continue writing my publications that I wrote for my clients, for my money management clients and uh, make a business out of it. So it's my hobby, actually. But uh, at the same time, uh, it's a business. 
uh, and I enjoy it like others uh, like to, um, you know, gardening or whatever. Uh, I like to follow the world, politics, the business cycle, rates, currencies, equity markets, commodities, what have you. Uh, this is where I feel home. And, and usually I go to the office uh, eight to nine o'clock in the morning. Used to be six to seven in the old days, <laughs> yeah. uh, but and and then I I go home over lunchtime, which is five minutes from where my office is. My wife cooks me an old traditional style uh, lunch <laughs> uh, and spoils me, and uh, <clears throat> and in the afternoon I'm back in the office. Uh, I trade the markets. Uh, I write. I think. Uh, I go for a walk uh, for about forty five minutes uh, during the day. Uh, to keep uh, myself uh, fit, and uh, and I return home uh, at about six o'clock, and I follow the markets until ten o'clock when New York closes. And in the morning, when I wake up at seven or so, or before seven, I usually check Asia, and that's that's how my life really. Uh, is is organized i love it okay and for context you're based in zook right in the middle of switzerland uh i'm sure we had some people when you when you said you are you are you eat a very traditional lunch uh traditional in what context so that's where we're at um now yeah you got a very early start you mentioned 18 years old began managing money uh if i've got my facts straight at 23 years old you took a very large personal loan to invest in the market really cut your teeth at, at a very young age so we're talking about a 50-year span right from the 1970s through to today and as a consequence you've invested through many cycles and one of the key challenges i see new investors make and one that i fall victim to frequently is is recency bias right we get so wrapped up in the micro events of the now right and it affects our decision making and and all of this so i guess you know that's that's why this conversation excited me so much because i hope to get some perspective from you and so when you look at the markets today felix and i know you're a cycles guy that's that's your 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 core structure if, if i've got that right you know talking about where you think we are in what cycles right now and what you think or what you are paying the most attention to okay um the bigger time span of course and I, I i will be very brief is when Bretton woods broke down in the early 70s and then we had the four careers where we reintroduced stability into the system and he cleaned the system and handed it over to greenspan and from Greenspan on, we are in a new era. We are in the era of easy money. And with Bernanke, we entered the era of very aggressively easy money. And the uh, fiscal policy is out of line. And this is the long, very long secular cycle. Uh, that cycle, I think, will come to an end within the next 10 years. Uh, and then I break it down in secular bull markets in between. Uh, 2009 was a major, major low, a secular low. And from there, we started a secular bull market. And in that secular bull market, I think the 2020 low was the last low in that bull market. In other words, what started in 2020 is the final mini cycle that leads to the final peak of the bull cycle that started in 2009. And, uh, and my hunch is that that peak will probably be about two years from now, 2024. Um, I do see a, a big correction coming in the first half of 2022. I do not believe it's the end of the bull market because I think the authorities are afraid of asset prices going down a lot. And I could very well see that the stock market, instead of declining uh, 10%, could decline 30% because of all the excesses that have built up on the positioning side. When you see that in the last 12 months, uh, as much money flowed into equity and equity products as in the previous 20 years. Mm. Uh, so this is a, an excess of a century. And if you have one excess in one direction, that leads to another excess in the opposite direction. So I think we are uh, probably in for a bigger shakeout, the very painful one in the first half, could be down 
and that will bring on a renewed stimulus by the authorities that will lengthen the cycle and will lead to the second wave of rising commodity prices and rising inflation. And that should be 23, uh, 24. And uh, I could easily see that, uh, let's say, crude oil declines to $50 or so this summer. Uh, it could then rise to $200 in 2024. And we could see 10% or higher uh, CPI inflation rates in 2024. Uh, so I think uh, 23, 24 is a period of rising rates. Central banks cannot uh, refuse to uh, tighten. They have to tighten. And that will eventually break uh, the stock, uh, the bull market uh, in equities, in commodities, and will shake the whole system and the fabric of the credit system. So I think the downturn after 24, when this cycle ends, will be a very serious one that you compare to um, what happened after 29, for instance a major washout uh, of the system. Of course, the times are different. Uh, government is more important, more involved, uh, more interventionist, more activist this time, but it will lead to a different world and, uh, and a very uh, difficult period with social uh, upheavals and unrest and, uh, and uh, revolutions against the establishment and things like that. So this is the big picture, and this is the cyclical picture in, in very few words. Okay. I love that. So uh, to, to recap, as I heard it, you know, we could look for some kind of a, a sharp correction in the early parts of 2022 on the back of that more stimulus leading to more inflation, rising commodity prices, eventually rising rates, causing that, you know, 2024 uh, time span, the real crash in the market that I think we've been kicking the can down the road for a few years here. Yes. Right. Um, so my question for you then, Felix, is you, you touched on a different world, right? That that's I love how you phrase that. There'll be a major washout, and then we're going to enter a different world. And as you said, we were in the era of Bretton Woods, and then uh, enter Greenspan, and the, the era of easy money, enter Bernanke, and the era of very easy money, enter Powell, maybe very very easy money. I don't know, but keep this going. I guess my question is, what's the next era then? You know, after the big washout, what's the era after the era of easy money? Well, the washout and correctional period will last uh, about 10 years or so uh, into the early 30s. And there will be uh, huge swings in the marketplace. Uh, the market uh, will then become uh, somewhat controlled by the governments. Uh, there will be more manipulations, more interventions, more regulations. Uh, I believe that uh, we will lose part of our freedom. Um, because governments uh, do not want us uh, to be free because otherwise they, they could not control the system anymore and they want to control the system. And there will be a fight between, between those who want to be saved by the government and those who want to be free. You know, uh, those who want to be uh, in a cozy environment where the government takes care of them and others who want to be free and decide for themselves. And, and, and it's building up. And I think you see it already with the vaccination, what's going on. And, and it's going to be uh, not just uh, medical and health. It's also becoming economic and, uh, and, then, and then political. Uh, so I think it's a complete social revolution that we are facing. And I cannot tell you how it will work out, but I, I think uh, we could see... Um, Eventually, uh, uh, governments defaulting. We could see currency reforms. Uh, we could see lots of losses of those uh, that have uh, and supports for the have-nots and things like that. So I, I cannot describe you in every detail how it will look like, but I think you have to be prepared for the general direction in which things are moving. What could also come in, which I do not know yet, is usually when you have a difficult uh, economic period, um, nations tend to, be, to become very nationalistic. Uh, mm -hmm. And the Chinese are turning very nationalistic. Um, uh, the US is becoming nationalistic. 
The Europeans are trying to build a European bloc. Uh, they keep trying. They will never achieve what they have in mind, but, but they keep trying. Uh, and uh, it will create um, problems between individual nations. One wants to become part of a, uh, a union, uh, United States of Europe, uh, Greater Europe. Uh, others do want do not want to lose their sovereignty, etc. So lots of problems and there could be there could be uh, situations where we have some uh, uh, military um, conflicts uh, there are plenty of uh, problems around i do not believe that china uh, will take taiwan uh, in a military way but i guess that russia will eventually take that part of the ukraine that is ethnically uh, russian which is the eastern mm. part of the ukraine um, uh, I, I think uh, in the very shorter uh, distance, we have probably um, Israel uh, taking out the, the nuclear site of Iran. Something, something will happen. And, uh, and when you see that Russia has moved its uh, 41st army from Siberia through half of Russia, which is several time zones, that's 100,000 troops to the border of the Ukraine. I don't believe that you do that just for a maneuver. I, I think this is more serious. Mm. So, so there is a lot of things to happen. And unfortunately, the former world policemen used to be strong, powerful, and in control of the system and organized the system the way the Western world liked it. And I'm talking about the U.S., has now the weakest administration ever, even weaker than the Carter administration. And this is an invitation for problems and troubles uh, around the globe. Okay, this is way more interesting than talking about the market. So we're going to stick with this because uh, I have so many questions for you. I see a lot of these trends that you're discussing, this shift towards safetyism, right? And you described it as maybe two communities, one gravitating towards safetyism and more government control for safety reasons, whether that's financial, social, whatever that is, and another that might gravitate more towards freedom and sovereignty, right? And mm -hmm. I, I put myself in this camp, uh, absolutely. You know, a big proponent of this show and, and why I do this is because I'm seeking ways to retain my personal sovereignty, right? And, um, and that's why this- two of us, Jay. <laughs> it makes two of us. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So a couple of questions, you know, I, I feel like I see the same trends that you're seeing that, you know, and you know, we're, we're now seeing a lot of, a lot more power shift to the hands of our governments. I'm based in Canada, you know, my wife's American. So I, I culturally pay the most attention to the U S and Canada. Um, my kids all have dual citizenship. So we actually have a conversation frequently these days about, you know, we're watching the developments in Canada, we're watching the developments in the US and wondering, you know, will there be a time in the near future where we're gonna option these US passports? Because here's a question for you. What I love about the US is the sovereignty of the states, right? You, I've been in the last six months, I've been to Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and every state operates at this moment with all the travel restrictions and, and social restrictions, almost like its own country. So, you know, depending on what your risk tolerance is or your freedom requirements are, you can find a state that more likely fits that than being in, in a place like Canada where it's more federal, more blanket regulation, right? So do you see that changing in the US where there's more and more, I guess, more and more division or difference and separation between the states you see federal government controls trying to limit that. Do you have any thoughts on that, Felix? Well, if you go back to the founding fathers, I think the founding fathers wanted, uh, wanted a union, but wanted to have very powerful uh, sovereignty in the individual states. And, and I think that's the basic of the U.S. Um, um, uh, what's the right word for it? It's not the law. It's uh, the founding the founding block uh, for the U.S. And uh, Switzerland is very similar, by the way. Uh, our uh, political system has been built according to the U.S. system. We have uh, sort of a Senate and sort of a representative house. Uh, 
and uh, and uh, even the cantons, which are our states, have even more power than your states, even more power. So the tax sovereignty is not with the federal government. That's only a small share. The tax sovereignty is with the individual states, and therefore they are competing. And the competition is what makes you strong. Uh, making every, everything equal makes you weak. Mm. Uh, so, so you need to have competition to make progress and to uh, uh, create a better world. And, and I cannot tell you how it will uh, turn out, but I would assume that uh, 10 to 15 years from now, the world will have more countries than today mm. because of secessions. There will be secessions because uh, some ethnic groups may say, well, to the other group, well, you know, we had a good time so far, but now we disagree and it's better for us to be good neighbors than march uh, along each other's side. And, and that's what I see ahead. And, uh, and I think uh, you will also see those breaks uh, within the European Union. There are rifts going through the European Union in all directions on immigration, uh, you have Germany on one side, which is very soft, and you have Eastern Europe uh, and, and France uh, being very tough. Uh, they disagree. Then you have, um, you, you have had Germany that used to be tough on stability and uh, government debt and indebtedness. Uh, uh, and you had France and Italy and Greece that are on the other side. Now Germany has uh, given in. Uh, they are becoming more French and uh, more Italian-like, and they will pay for all the sins in Europe, and they do not realize that uh, they will be very weakened and will never be the Germany again that they used to be over the last 50 years. Hmm. So, so there are all sorts of problems, and the UK broke away from the European Union because they hold up freedom in much higher esteem uh, than the Europeans, which uh, Europe, the Europeans are socialists uh, by nature, in a way. Some countries more than others, some individuals more than others. But, uh, you know, you can see from the government share of GDP, which, is, which has jumped in the US from the low 20% to the high 30% in a few years' time. Uh, you see in, in, in Europe, you have uh, Germany that has jumped to 54%, uh, the European Union 59%, France 64%, government share of GDP. You know, that's socialism. And, uh, and, and therefore, Europe will not be very competitive in the uh, future ahead. Because mm -hmm. of all that. That's really interesting. And I actually didn't know a lot of that about Switzerland, how sovereign the states were until we hopped in this call. And you mentioned, for example, where you are in Zouk. What did you say? A 50% break in your taxes compared to if you lived in Zurich, which is a 20 yeah. minute drive away. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Even in the military, we have, uh, we have, I mean, it's under the guidance of the federal government. But you have um, uh, troops that belong to each state, so to speak. Okay. Uh, so we have state troops and we have federal troops all under the guidance of the of the federal government. Okay, interesting. Now, now, so therefore, let's let's follow this trajectory of more government control. Yes, you've got the U.S. as the global superpower now on their heels. Whenever anyone's on their heels, you can expect more extreme measures to retain power. You see that in any, see that in, in a boxing match, right? You start swinging for the fences sure. when you know you've got the clock ticking against you. Uh, so therefore, do you see more safe havens begin to emerge? And if put yourself in my position as somebody who runs a business that's 90% location independent, I could be anywhere, right? Um, you know, so we're looking at relocating to somewhere where sovereignty might be stronger, somewhere like Texas, maybe somewhere like Switzerland. Do you think you go somewhere like that? Or do you go to a highly unorganized country where things are just likely to remain sovereign because the country's a bit of a mess? I, I'm talking about some developing nations. 
it's it's too early to say uh, because there is a movement that is trying to uh, uh, get rid of sovereign nations and have a world government. You know, you when you when you read the the Great Reset the program by the World Economic Forum, they are trying to change the world and they are trying to change it toward global socialism, and they want to remove major power from large powers like the UN, uh, the US and, and give the power to the UN. We recently had a vote in, uh, in the UN that they wanted to make um, uh, climate uh, investments um, um, for every nation, that every nation had to subscribe and sign that they have to a certain percentage of GDP uh, put into investments against climate change. And uh, due to Russia's and China's veto, we didn't get it. But mm. you see it on taxes. There is now an agreement in the OECD. The OECD used to be an organization to help economic planning for each nation. And it has become now a, a, a body for the internationalists to uh, cooperate and dictate uh, minimum tax rates in the world. You know, it's, it's terrible. They have decided the corporate tax rates at the minimum must be 15%. And the US signed uh, and, and, and all the European side, I talked to our government, they signed and they signed because they say, if we do not sign, they will they will blackmail us and they will make our life miserable. Therefore, you have these different movements that are going on and these trends, uh, most people are not aware of it, uh, but it's a big fight. And I hope that uh, these dark pools behind the World Economic Forum that are pushing for this change are losing out eventually, but it will be a tough struggle. Okay. Now, you all also talked about some some cultural cycles that we're witnessing right now and a shift in thinking and, and you know back to to what you shared about like it's you know maybe two teams one driving towards safetyism one driving towards freedom we we saw this rise of populism begin to accelerate before the pandemic occurred now the pandemic's just been like added pressure on a lot of these trends because you just add 10 points to everybody's baseline anxiety if nothing else um Here's a question for you, Felix. One thing I'm wondering about, I've got three young boys. They're, they're one, three, and five, right? So we're just beginning to think about education and how we're going to raise our kids and what kind of experiences we want them to have and all this stuff. And, and a key component of most cultures that I notice today that's missing is a coming of age ritual, right? That sort of marks the transition from childhood to adulthood. And I think it's really important because you know, I look around me today and I see a lot of my friends in their 30s still kind of wandering around like lost children, you know, and and I wonder how much of that, that loss of identity and, and loss of some sort of coming of age ritual, which in, in most most societies of the past is quite quite prevalent. It's like the common denominator. There's always something that marks the shift from childhood to adulthood. We don't have that now. Am I is that a is that a weird thing to wonder about that that's missing and maybe that's one of the root causes that people are now looking for someone else to protect them, someone else to keep them safe instead of just owning their response, owning their life and owning their future. It's an important point. Uh, and, uh, and I think the social media uh, boom that we have been seeing in recent years due to the internet uh, has really reinforced that, that people, instead of getting to know themselves, are running for something that other people show them how to be and what to be. And therefore, they want to be someone else or like someone else, but they do not know themselves and do not know what makes them really happy in their life. And I think the most important thing for a young person is to find out what you really like and what you love and what would make you happy in life. And, and that really tells you what profession you should take, in which direction you should go. And then it depends where you stand in the long-term cycle. And if you match your requirements and your um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, 
laughs that you that you like to and activities that you like to per, uh, per, uh, pursue, then you can match the environment and your own uh, talents and then become successful and happy because when you are successful, you become happy. Uh, and if you are not successful and if you are chasing something that is out there and you want to be like somebody else, you will never be a happy person. You will become a sheep and you will follow what the, the big guru up there tells you, whether it's the government or a social media star or whatever, you know. And, and I think the majority of the people are sheeps, uh, un unfortunately, in, instead of getting to know themselves and finding their own way. And this has nothing to do with the level of education. That is true on all levels. It mm -hmm. has nothing to do with that. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody cleaning the streets is wiser in finding out what makes him happy in life than a university professor. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. And this lack of identity that I see, I mean, if you, if you lack your, an idea of what you are and, and therefore what you want to be, then how could you feel confident that you could be competitive, right? Because competitive at what, right? If yeah. you lack the belief that you could be competitive, then the thought that you'd want to retain any sovereignty or direction, you know, independent direction of your life would be lacking because you wouldn't be clear on what that could be. Yeah. Um, you, you have to know whether you are a person who wants to be guided or whether you are a person who wants to guide. You know, this, this is also important uh, because this decides which way you should go in your professional activities and career. And, the, you know, the, the, the saddest outcome would be somebody who decides they want to be guided because they've never tried guiding, right? And so... You know, I know we're uh, running against the clock here, but what what sort of advice would you have, Felix? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying and I'm like, everybody needs to try leading. Everybody needs to try guiding. They, they need to step out front to see if they like it. You know what I mean? And and maybe try failing at it and try it again. That's, that's usually the, the process that works. As parents, uh, and you are a father as I am, you see very early uh, what your kids, uh, what the nature of your kids is. Some, when you are on the playground with other kids, you see very clearly who are those who want to guide and dictate and say, we go in this direction. And you see others who are just running after them when they run ahead. You know, it's, it's, it, you see it uh, even at the kid's age, you see it. And then it develops over time. And some kid develop earlier and some kid later. Yeah. Uh, and you have to follow that. Uh, it's, I think it's nature. It's, uh, it's a natural thing. Uh, the majority probably wants to be guided, and the, the majority of people are happy if they have um, a, jo a regular job, a stable income, uh, uh, some uh, well-being. Um, they can go to sport events, cultural, cultural events, uh, some vacation, some traveling, and then they are happy. Others are only happy if they can only decide for themselves which way they want to go you know uh, so it, it's it's different it's different it's different and you know here's the here's the fact that i believe no matter what box you land in you are the only author of your life and you only get one chance to author this life and so what are you going to do with it right you don't get those days back and you that's, create your own right. reality absolutely and uh everybody else creates theirs right so you're very wise for your age, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Look, um, we're, we're over time here. I really appreciate you making time to chat with me, Felix, and to get in front of my audience. Uh, I feel like I could, I could keep you for another two hours and just keep going on so many other threads and buckets. So I'd love to do this again sometime. What I want to leave uh, you and your audience with is uh, the next uh, 10 years are... Uh, to diff are going to be very different from the last 10 years. Uh, I think in the last 10 years, in, in your investment approach, you had to be a passive investor, buy and hold. If you could pick the right stocks, the right six stocks uh, in the world that went up like uh, the Microsofts and the Googles, 
Perfect. But if you were a passive investor, you did extremely well. That approach will not work again in the next 10 years. The next 10 years will be a roller coaster in the markets and you will have to time the market cycles. And on top of that, you have to be a good um, a stock picker and pick the right stocks. So when you look at the valuation of equities today and you compare it in the past, what sort of 10 year real return you got uh, from today's level for world equities as well as for US equities, you get the real return of 0% or even a little bit less over the next 10 years. But the next 10 years will not be a straight line at zero. It will be a roller coaster. And if you want to uh, create a bigger or a higher return than zero, you have to time the cycles. That's very, that's very important. And therefore, you have to adapt to it. And there are not that many people around because the old guys like me, uh, they may do it for themselves, but they there are not many Stanley Druckenmillers and Tudor Joneses around. Mm. And the young breed of hedge fund managers are long, short people who are basically long with a few shorts to justify higher fees. But but whether they they have proven, most or the majority has proven that they cannot really add value in down markets. And uh, I have been fortunate. I have um, made good money in every bear cycle since I'm in the market. And, uh, and that is a compounding effect that you don't want to lose in the long term. So I usually make a little bit less than I should uh, on the upside, but I never lose on the downside and usually make money. And that's the compounding effect that helps you over time. So the next 10 years will be different. Prepare yourself, read some books, uh, uh, discuss it with your colleagues, with prof professionals, et cetera, et cetera. That's very important. So, so what's the play? I have to ask there because timing cycles and, and timing highs and lows is something most investors just won't be able to do for lack of time investment. They work a nine to five. They've got family obligations. So they only have a few hours to look at the market. You know, if the, the long term buy and hold strategy is off the table in the broad equities market, where, where do they go for that? Is it safe well, uh, assets? Th th then you have to find. Then you have to find uh, a, a professional who does it for you. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, in a in a cycle, you you don't have to. I I don't mean to trade every two or three weeks, uh, uh, short and long. Uh, the cycles usually last uh, two years up and uh, a year or two down and, and things right. like that. Right. And you have to have a certain understanding of what makes. Uh, prices move. Uh, usually that's liquidity. So it's the monetary side of the aspect. And then you look at valuation and positioning that tells you how high or how low the risk is. And, uh, and then you look at certain sentiments. And then you see like in the last 12 months, that all of a sudden, the amount of money that was put into equities in the previous 20 years goes into the market in one year, that tells you you are not at the bottom, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Felix, thank, thanks so much. Thanks again. I'd love to do this again sometime. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jay. All the All best. Right. Hey guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.